When you think of Africa, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Um, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Poverty. Um, when I think about Africa, I'd like to share with you what I think about Africa and some of the interesting things that I've had the pleasure of working uh, with and also uh, to introduce you to others in the technology space um, in Kenya and other parts of Africa. Now, with that image of Africa that you have in your mind, uh, there's a new image of Africa emerging. This new image of Africa is being shared by bloggers such as Emeka Okafor, who's also the TED Africa director. These are new ideas. Uh, these are ideas that Africans themselves are trying to find ways to create solutions uh, for African problems. Uh, these are stories of ingenuity uh, with uh, sites like AfriGadget, and these are stories of innovation um, that are also rooted in history and tradition. In 2007, I attended my first TED conference in um, Arusha, Tanzania. There, I got to meet Eric, Ori, and others in the uh, global tech community. And at that conference, I really, it was an amazing place to connect with others, but also we had this sort of like myth busting that happened during that conference. There were many ideas shared that um, showed so much potential uh, in Africa and for the future of Africa. Later that year, I was in um, Kenya on holiday. Ori, my colleague, was also um, on holiday in Kenya, and it was an election year. And little did we know that um, between 27th of December of 2007 and the 31st of December 2007, that our country would be plunged into chaos. With post-election violence erupting all over the place, it was a very, very difficult time. And that's when we came up with Ushahidi. And that's when we came up with Ushahidi. The idea behind Ushahidi is that I'd like to be able to say, this is what I see, this is what's going on around the corner. And for that story, because the, the, the situation in Kenya at the time was very complex and it, was, it could have been very easy to say, oh, that's just another uh, genocide like Rwanda, but it was a bit of a, it was a different situation. So um, we'll take a quick moment to hear a, to listen to a video, and you'll get to hear from some of my colleagues about how Ushahidi came about. It allows people to participate you know, instead of one organization saying that here's what happened. I think this is an opportunity for everyone to create the narrative making it many to many instead of one to many like we have been accustomed to. I think a lesson to learn here is that aid is more effective if the loop is round. When you implement a program where you collect data, you can close the loop by feeding back information to the citizens uh, in a useful way and in a format that they can use. When the post-election violence broke out in Kenya, I had been covering the election quite a bit on my blog. And in that process, the disconnect between what I was hearing from my sources and what was happening in the media was very wide. And so I posted the idea of what then became Oshahidi onto my blog. And then uh, Eric got in touch. That was home for me. Kenya's always been home for me. And uh, it's where my network runs deepest on the continent. Oshahidi became successful because we had the support of the Kenyan bloggers. We ended up with more than 131 unique IP addresses submitting information into the mashup of our three-month period. And so that was, that was Ushahidi saying, look, okay, here is a very simple rudimentary application that allows us to get reports from ordinary people saying what's going on around them in this crazy chaotic space that was Kenya at the time. Ushahidi, at the time we built it, which was two years ago, was already three-year-old technology anybody in the world could have built this three years prior to when we built it. So the technology was nothing new or groundbreaking and still isn't. It's the a use of this technology in a more 
dynamic way, that is groundbreaking. To me, saving one life alone has validated the Shahidi entirely. So that makes a big difference. I'm, I'm completely satisfied. So a few months after we created the first prototype, we um, made the code open source, and that made the code available for others to innovate and to also help us, such that others do not have to start from scratch. A few months later, um, s other activists in India used the platform to crowdsource information about irregularities in the election in India. And in Atlanta, the platform can also be used for visualizing information. All this time, we worked hard to uh, fix bugs and to make it more robust. And um, so th this is just a, an, um, one of the few applications. It's recently been used in the UK to map where the cuts are happening. The significance of this is when there are, when you read a, a, a newspaper piece about spending cuts that are happening, uh, that are being brought on by the government, uh, with the Open Knowledge Foundation, they're using the software to show people what this means on the ground level. What does this mean? Um, does it mean that my uh, a school nearby is not going to get that it's the money that it's um, that uh, will it reduce their budget? What does it mean to have all this data and how does it affect me? You can sign up for an alert, that way you can be notified when there's news of a spending cut that you care about. So, um, so this idea of using this technology within the open data movement is actually um, instructive because um, if they can do this in the UK, then other people in, with other governments, uh, they, can use other, uh, they can use open data from governments to translate that to you and I to figure out what do I care about and how do I take this piece of information and act upon it. Um, in building this software, there are a few lessons that we learned that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, when you, we used the platform to crowdsource the information around the Haiti earthquake, um, my colleague David said that sometimes it felt like we were fixing the plane as it was flying. But the key thing was to release early, to fly and to innovate and to prototype as you go along. And if something does not work, do not be afraid to toss it out. But the key thing is to get going. And um, we did it ourselves, we did not wait for others. So if you find something in your commun community that you can do something about using the skills that you have, the key thing is to go ahead and do it yourself and see what you can do with your skills. And um, lastly, the community that we build around this tool is what is sustaining us because um, you can't, technology is just one part of it. The community that helps you achieve what you'd like to, to achieve is integral to all this. And when we started collaborating, we all had our own other jobs. Uh, uh, Eric was working in, uh, was doing some business in Florida. I was um, your average geek in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> Ori was a lawyer in South Africa and David was running a company in Atlanta. So sometimes there's random acts of kindness, but there's also random acts of collaboration. Do not be afraid to band together with others and do something um, that you feel can make a change. Okay. Give me just a second here. <laughs> It's one, one gigabyte, so if you need to put data in there. <laughs> so just mentioning a bit about our community. When we first started, uh, actually even before Ushahidi, 
we were literally collaborating in the open. We would meet in coffee shops, in supermarkets. This is a picture of one of our early meetings where we were hashing out ideas in a supermarket in Nairobi. And um, the key is to build your community. You really do not need a physical space, but um, if you call us people that care about what you do and um, it's, it's a fantastic way to, to move forward. And building on Ushahidi, we also finding that there are other problems. For example, when we deployed the platform to aggregate the data from the Haiti earthquake, we realized that there's a lot of um, information overload. So we created Swift River, and this is a news filtering piece of software that is also open source that helps you make sense of all this real-time information. CrowdMap is a cloud-based version of Ushahidi, such that if you wanted to try out this idea of crowdsourcing and have some information that you need to visualize, you can try it out online. Very easy, it's as easy as setting up an email. And um, extending that idea of community, there's a co-working space in Nairobi called iHub. So let's go back to the image of Africa. Now, just to give you a bit of context, this is the true size of Africa. The United States can fit into west of Africa. That in orange is China. So this image by Kai Cruz is instructive in showing us the potential. For many years, Africa, the cost of um, communication from Africa to the rest of the world was very high. But now, Africa is now being connected with fiber optic cables that is reducing the cost of connection and the cost of communicating with the rest of the world. This is immense potential. Africa is perhaps the next technology frontier, if not the current. Um, one of the people that I greatly admire, Ethan Zuckerman, a, uh, a, an academic at the Berkman Institute, uh, Berkman Center at Harvard, um, noticed that he noted that the internet is the most powerful tool created by humans to allow connection and collaboration. So, and with Global Voices, one of the organizations that he started and that I was also a part of before joining Ushahidi, one of the key lessons that I learned is you absolutely have to connect with others, not only in um, your geographical area, but to use the internet to connect with others. When you mix these two things, technology and great people, amazing things happen. And I'd like to mention a few trends and a few interesting things that are happening. I'll mention in East Africa, because we don't have that much time, um, and, uh, I feel guilty using the word Africa because like we saw it's immense. So I'll just give you a taste of what's happening in East Africa, particularly in Kenya. Teddy Ruge is, um, he's a diaspora African. He lives in Texas, but he goes home often. And he heard about the MDGs and called home and he was talking with his mother who's a, a community leader and was wondering, Mom, have you heard of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals? And she had not heard about the Millennium Development Goals, and she represents uh, a section of, uh, of Uganda that's very poor. So he's using the internet to stream a conference called Villages in Action to bring the voice of the poor, such that it's not just about policies for the poor, but that these policies also include the voice of the poor. So it's this shift from um, technology for, but technology with. And that's the promise of talk, technology for social change. There are many companies ranging from South Africa all the way into West Africa staking a claim on the digital future of the continent. And one of the key things that is revolutionizing um, how we do business in Africa is the idea of mobile money. In Kenya, I can pay for my groceries using my mobile phone. Can you do that in Canada? 
It's quite amazing. With 10%, more than 10% of the GDP of Kenya flowing through mobile money, this is one way, this is one, tech, one way that um, technology in Africa is very unique, but also can be suited for other, um, for, for worldwide impact. That technology has been used now in Afghanistan and also it's being piloted by Vodafone in Germany. One of the companies in Kenya that is uh, capitalizing on this idea of mobile money is PaySapal. PaySapal allows people who may not have credit cards, but they have mobile phones with credit, with money on it. So it's bringing a, p a percentage of the population who have mobile money and allows them to purchase from the internet. So this is quite revolutionary. Meet Akira Chicks, this group of geek girls in Kenya have built many cool apps. One of those applications is called mFarm. mFarm allows farmers to not only connect with other farmers in the nearby area, but to also find um, the nearest suppliers and most importantly, to get market information without the intervention of brokers. This is Continue, a continuation of those ideas that started in TED Global in, in um, Tanzania several years ago. The key idea is African solutions for African problems. And the rebranding of Africa is happening from within. With a company like uh, Africa Knows, you get to see Africa through the eyes of African photographers. And the image that you see will be different. It will be authentic and I guarantee it'll be beautiful. So with this mix of technology that allows for participation, we're also seeing the idea of co-creation. With the recently concluded Maker Fair in Africa, we had artists, um, electronics enthusiasts, roboticists coming together to figure out um, unique ways that they can make cool stuff in Africa. When people meet based on passion, you get to see really amazing things. These are just a few of the co-working spaces that are springing up around Africa. From Uganda, Senegal, Cameroon, and other parts of Africa, we're seeing people, we're seeing entrepreneurs finding ways, creating solutions, that are relevant not just for the African context. A lot of companies in South Africa actually make products that have impact elsewhere. So what I'd like to take, aw I'd like for you to take away from today is that there is so much more to come. Ushahidi was one of the stories that you may either have heard about or may not have heard about, but there's a lot more to come in Africa and from Africa. And I hope uh, in some shape or form that your view of Africa has been made a little bit more complex. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>